technologies in model systems which will address questions on how to link circuit activity behaviour and discuss latest generation tools to observe neural function as well as approaches to control activity. Now, as before, there will be a question and answer session uh, at the end of all the presentations, so please do uh, wave your hand furiously at me when you have a question to ask, and I'll make sure a microphone gets to you. Now, the first presentation in this section is by Professor Giro Miesenbach, a Professor of Psychology and Founding Director of the Centre for Neural Circuits and Behaviour at the University of Oxford, who's going to speak to us about optogenetic genetics and sleep regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it is um, really a privilege to be here. In fact, the privilege is so large that I decided to share it uh, and uh, brought along my doppelganger. This is Dr. Gero. Um, we have many more things in common than just the first name. He's also a scientist, um, a mad one in a Japanese comic called Dragon Balls. Um, he strives for world domination, just like I do. And um, if you look very carefully, you can see that his skull has been replaced with a transparent plexiglass dome so that his brain is open to optical control. And that's, of course, exactly what we do. We modify specific classes of neurons genetically so that these cells can respond to optical control signals. And these two ingredients, optics and genetics, have given the field its name. Before I explain how it works, let me just spend one minute to consider why being able to interfere with the function of the nervous system is a valuable thing to do. If you like puzzles, and if you're a neuroscientist, you'd better, you probably know that staring long and hard at a difficult problem rarely gives you the answer. It's typically much more productive to play with the problem, to try different solutions, to see whether you can find patterns that can fall into place. But historically, neuroscientists have mostly stared at the brain, not played with it. Part of the reason is the enormous complexity of the nervous system. Even the brains of the fruit flies that we study consist of a few hundred thousand nerve cells that come in many different flavors and have millions of connections between them. So where to begin? But there's one organizing principle behind this seemingly impenetrable complexity, and that's the genetic programs that orchestrate the development of the nervous system. And one of the key concepts of optogenetics, and in fact, of many technologies that are now used to study the function of the nervous system, is to use these genetic blueprints as the platform for our experimental interventions. So we use specific genetic markers to insert into the membranes of neurons that we have in this manner highlighted ion channels. These ion channels are just like the ion channels that are responsible for all electrical signaling in the brain with one important difference. They are coupled to photoreceptors so that when a photon of light strikes the receptor, it changes its shape. The shape change is transmitted to the pore of the channel. A small current flows and the neuron fires an impulse. Now, what motivated the invention of optogenetic control was the idea that a technology like this would open three experimental doors that had previously been locked. The first of these doors is the identification of the neuronal causes of behavior. If playing back particular electrical activity patterns into the brain recreated perceptions, actions, emotions, memories, as we've just seen in, um, in David's talk, then, of course, we would um, be closer to understanding what normally underpins these aspects of our mental lives. The second locked door is the search for connections between neurons, which is a prerequisite for deciphering the wiring diagrams of the brain. Scanning a stimulating light beam across neural tissue is a more efficient way of doing this than painstaking searches with electrodes. 
And the third locked door, of course, is uh, the ability to test mechanistic hypotheses. If you had an idea how something worked, then interfering with the system would be the way to find out whether you are right or wrong. Now, as my illustration today, I've chosen one problem in which optogenetics has allowed us to open all three of these previously locked doors. And that problem is the control of sleep. Sleep is one of the great biological mysteries. Each night, we disconnect ourselves from the world for seven or eight hours, a state that leaves us vulnerable and unable to do what we need to do in order to propagate the species. Yet, despite these risks and costs, we still don't know what sleep is good for. It's widely thought that there's two mechanisms in the brain that determine whether we are asleep or awake. These two controllers are symbolized on this diagram by two different forms of oscillation. The sine wave symbolizes the circadian clock, which oscillates in synchrony with predictable changes in the external environment that are caused by the Earth's rotation. As such, the clock is an adaptive mechanism that helps us to do our necessary sleeping when it hurts us least, but it cannot speak to the mystery of why we need to sleep in the first place. An understanding of that problem will likely come from insight into the second control mechanism called the sleep homeostat, which is symbolized here by the sawtooth oscillation that's superimposed on the sine wave. The homeostat measures something, and we don't know what that something is, that happens in our brains while we are awake. And when that something hits a certain ceiling, we go to sleep. The system is reset during the sleep, and when we wake up, the cycle begins um, anew. Now, we know a lot about the circadian clock, and this is the Rosetta Stone that broke the problem open. The discovery 45 years ago by Seymour Benza and his graduate student Ron Konopka of fruit flies whose circadian clocks ran abnormally fast or slow. And from this discovery flowed a pretty complete molecular, cellular, and systems understanding of circadian timekeeping. This slide, in contrast, summarizes much of what we know about sleep homeostasis. My goal for the rest of the talk will be to draw a few outlines on this blank canvas. The story begins with the discovery by Jeff Donnelly of sleep control neurons in the brains of fruit flies. Optogenetics has enabled us to show that these neurons represent the output arm of the sleep homeostat and that they exert a powerful influence over sleep and waking. This is how we do the experiments. We fix a fruit fly to a mount and let it walk or rest on a spherical treadmill, a little styrofoam ball whose rotations we monitor with an optical computer mouse. Because there are no documented cases of somnambulism in flies, we know that when the fly is walking, it must be awake. What you can see is that we are also measuring the electrical activity of one of the sleep control neurons and that we've expressed our light-gated ion channels in all of these cells. Here's an experiment lasting for half an hour. You see that during the first few minutes, the sleep control neurons whose activity we are monitoring is silent. It does not emit any electrical impulses, and the fly is walking along happily. As soon as we switch on the lights, the sleep control neuron becomes electrically active, and movement quickly stops the fly goes to sleep. When we take the drive away, the sleep control neuron falls silent again, and the fly wakes up and begins to walk. When we switch the cells back on, movement once again stops. So we have isolated a switch in the brain that allows us to toggle the animal between sleep and waking. Now, further studies showed us that these sleep control neurons naturally seem to exist in two states. One state in which they are electrically active, shown here on the left, and another state in which they are electrically silent, shown here on the right. Sampling the state of these sleep control neurons in large populations of flies suggested that the state of the neuron in the brain of the animal correlates with the sleep state of the fly. 
The, fly, the cells tend to be electrically active in flies that are asleep and electrically silent in flies that are awake. Now, that of course suggested that um, sleep homeostasis works simply by switching these sleep control neurons between electrically active and silent states. But in order to substantiate this idea, one would of course want to observe state switching by one such cell directly. One would like to understand how the switch works and also identify some of the signals that normally operate it. Now, a clue to what one of these signals uh, might be had come many, many years ago in the first experiments demonstrating optogenetic control of animal behavior that were done by my then graduate student, Susanna Lima, at Yale in 2004. What Susanna had done was she expressed the light-gated ion channels in all neurons in the brain of flies that signal through the molecule dopamine. And she then monitored the activity of the animals. What you see here are the walking tracks of four flies. Each column represents the same animal before and after switching on the dopamine-producing cells. You see, when the dopamine cells are off, the flies don't move much, but when she switches on uh, the dopamine neurons with light, the flies become highly aroused. Now, this arousing effect is consistent with the role of dopamine in our own brains. Most so-called uppers, drugs that uh, act as stimulants, such as amphetamine or cocaine, do so by elevating synaptic um, dopamine levels. So you would, of course, expect that an, uh, an arousal-promoting substance, such as dopamine, would shut down the sleep-promoting cells. And there's a potential dopamine delivery system in the brain just to do that. This is now a dopaminergic neuron that invades the brain region that's inhabited by the sleep control cells. In fact, um, the dopamine neurons shadow the sleep control cells so tightly that they seem tailor-made just to control the activity of these cells. So the question is, are the two cell types connected? And of course, optogenetic activation of the dopamine cells while we record the activity of the sleep control cells can give us the answer. Here's the answer. We start with a sleep control neuron in the electrically active state in a fly that's asleep. And then we begin to deliver dopamine by optogenetic stimulation. And you see that relatively quickly we can switch the sleep promoting cell off and wake the fly up. The fly begins to walk. If we stop the dopamine delivery, and uh, wait for a little while, often the cell flips back spontaneously to the electrically active state and the fly goes back to sleep. This, the ability to control the sleep switch at will has also given us the opportunity to understand how it works. And I'll just summarize in the form of a cartoon what we have discovered. What happens is that in electrically active sleep control cells, a molecule that we've discovered and termed Sandman is sequestered in the inside of the cells. When dopamine binds to its receptor, Sandman is translocated to the outer surface of the cells. The Sandman is a passive leak conductance that acts to short-circuit the activity of the sleep-promoting cells and shuts them down. So what I've described then is a device that's in many ways similar to one that you're all familiar with because you have it on the wall of your living rooms. But instead of this device measuring temperature and switching on the heat when it's too cold, this device measures sleep need and puts you to sleep when your sleep need exceeds a certain limit. The billion dollar question in all of this, of course, is what is the equivalent of temperature in this system? What does the sleep homeostat respond to? I'd argue that if we knew the answer, we would be one very large step closer to unraveling the mystery of sleep. Before I conclude, let me take you back for just one moment into the stone age of optogenetics. Soon after we had started to develop the first optogenetic control technologies, I became aware that another scientist had seen the need for technologies like this. This scientist was Francis Crick, who, in a paper published in the millennial issue of the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, wrote, the next requirement for understanding the brain is to be able to turn the firing of one or more types of neuron on or off in a rapid manner in the behaving animal. The ideal signal would be light. 
This seems rather far-fetched, but it is conceivable that molecular biologists could engineer a particular cell type to be sensitive to light in this way. So when we had the first experiments that turned this far-fetched possibility into a reality, and these are these experiments, uh, what you're seeing here is a rat neuron grown in a dish that is, that is expressing a light-gated ion channel. And you see that the electrical activity of that neuron is quiet in the dark, but as soon as we switch on the lights, it responds with a volley of electrical impulses. So when we had these experiments, I sent Crick a preprint of our paper, and he responded in his characteristic style. If you read this wonderful book called The Eighth Day of Creation, which recounts the early history of molecular biology, you know that Francis Crick was a prolific letter writer who steered the development of the field through a vast correspondence that uh, always combined two stylistic hallmarks, encouragement and constructive criticism. And that's exactly what I got. Crick wrote that he had read the paper I sent him with great interest and was excited to see that the system already worked, at least to some extent. However, he realized, as I did, that it still needed improvement and that this would take further work. Unfortunately, Crick did not live to hear how our experiments progressed, but I think it's fair to say that as a result not only of our continued efforts, but also those of many others who later joined the field, the way we neuroscientists go about our business has fundamentally changed. Thank you.